Hi, everybody. Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome. Welcome in. Welcome to the show. We are in a series that is fire right now. It's called Facing Your Fears. <laughs> we just thought, you know what? New year. Let's face some fears. Um, and so this week, I am excited for you to hear this conversation. I, I did not know exactly where this conversation was going to go, but I got to the end of it. I just, I just wrapped it and I, I did not expect to become this encouraged. And I think you're going to love it because we're up against a pretty common fear among women, honestly, at this point of almost every age, um, that we have this like growing discomfort around. We have a huge pool of misinformation and disinformation. And obviously we are on the receiving end of a handful of billion dollar industries to keep us just like this. Um, because we're talking today about the fear of aging. It's real. It's super real. Um, I... I, I I feel like this is the air that we have, I have personally breathed since uh, forever, just literally forever, like in big ways, in small ways, in teeny little digs and words and sentences and campaigns and that we see that disparages aging in general. I turned 50 this year and that's a, that's a, it's like, both a big number and I'm still just me. Um, I turned 50 in August and I'm going to be more or less exactly like I am right now. <laughs> right? Like it's not this monumental, um, devastating milestone that a lot of people say that it is. Um, it's a pretty commonly known fact that as Americans, we a hundred percent live in an ageist society. We just do. Um, what is exactly ageism? Well, our guest this week defines it like this, judging, stereotyping, and discriminating against people on the basis of how old we think they are, which by the way, can also be younger people, it can be ageist against young people. Um, and I, I, it's so insidious that I don't think any single one of us is free of it. In fact, she told, she told me, she's like, every one of us ha has ageism, like kind of essentially baked into our bones. There's, there's no other way around it. Um, we come, we come by it naturally. These are messages we've had in front of us since we were kids. Um, you know, that aging bodies are bad. Older people are past their prime. We have a lot to fear and worry about. That, I feel like that's one that I'm experiencing a lot right now. Just and 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 then of course all these industries come in and tell us how to stop the tides. Here's how you can not age. Here, here's how you can stay forever young. Here's how you can stay forever relevant. You know, green is gold. And so this is a lot. It's a lot. And I I am not. I I refuse to accept that we're just stuck with this, right? because I don't think it's true, and neither does my guest today. We have author and activist Ashton Applewhite. She wrote a book called This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism, and this has been her work for two decades. Uh, it goes deep into the roots around ageism, where it comes from, how and why it divides us, how it can cripple the way our brains and bodies actually function, just the idea of it. And then all the toxic tentacles that reach everywhere from the workplace to the bedroom. And it's so interesting to hear her talk today. And she, this is all based in tons of research, research, by the way, that is encouraging. So whether aging isn't even a blip on your radar or you wake up daily with the dread of it or somewhere in between, this conversation is enlightening and sobering and needed. And I'm so glad to bring it to the show today. So without any further ado, please welcome Ashton Applewhite. Ashton, welcome to the podcast. I am, I'm really sincerely looking forward to this conversation with you and thankful for your time. You're welcome. Um, all right. So I've, I've already 
filled my listeners in a little bit about who you are and um, generally your work in the world right now um, into a space that you've called yourself a pro-aging radical. Big, I'm here for it. I like it. <laughs> I like it. It's it's gutsy. I like, it's aggressive in a way that I, I'm drawn to. Um, I wonder if you could, let, can we go just go back a little bit because this isn't necessarily the space that you probably saw yourself operating in. I mean, you know, what do you I want can, to do? Can I say I've ever up? had much of a career plan? So no, it wasn't. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about what got you here? Because um, life experience, was it something you noticed in your own perspectives? Was it some sort of internal sounding gong that started going off for you in a way that you couldn't ignore anymore? Or what was it that, if you will, radicalized you um, into pro-aging? Well, it was, um, th that's a great question and no one's put it to me in quite that way. I wish there was this, um, you know, meet cute moment or a moment where someone really disrespected me and I went, holy crap, that's ageist. I'm going to go get on a white horse and gallop windmills. It was not like that, but it was um, a function of um, hitting my mid fifties. So 15 years ago, now, more than that. Um, and realizing that two things like this getting old thing was actually happening to me. And I think just like they said, what, <laughs> well, like they said, but who knew they, you know, they were right about me. And I think part of that is because we live in such an ageist and sexist culture where it's a scary thought. But I think also part of it's just human. You know, when you're a kid, you like, why are people, you know, sitting still when they could be running around? We age slowly. And I think it is hard. We know that humans are not good at planning for the future. But guess what? I was not going to be the only human to whom this didn't happen. And the and and hand in hand with that was the realization that I was really apprehensive. I wouldn't say dreading, but I would say there was like this free floating anxiety and this, you know, pretty certain like it's all going to suck. What's going to suck the most and what's going to suck soonest. So I'm a nerdy person. I'm not an academic, but I am a writer, a reader, a researcher by avocation. So I started learning about longevity and talking, interviewing people over 80. And what I realized in a matter of, I want to say weeks, it feels like weeks, it was certainly months. I mean, it was very early into this trajectory that Almost everything I thought I knew about what it was going to be like to be significantly older was way off base or flat out wrong, or to put it kindly, like not nuanced enough. There, there are plenty of legitimate reasons to worry about the years ahead. And I no, never want to be thought of as a sugar coater, you know, just eat enough kale or do enough yoga, it'll all be fine. No, you know, th there, there are going to be challenges. But our fears are so much out of proportion to reality. We never hear the other side of the story. I mean, how come no one actually wants to go back to their youth? Would you? Not for a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't rehearse that, listeners. We didn't, you know, because, because we know that our years make us us. So, and, and I had a blog and I had one of those, now it sounds so old fashioned, but you know, one of those word clouds where you can see which things pop up and ageism was just like ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom in the middle of it. It just became obvious at the same time that we don't hear the other side of the story because we live in an ageist and sexist and capitalist patriarchy that profits from our fears and our ignorance. It's no um, surprise. That's a billion dollar industry. No kidding. Not, um, and not just, the, that's just the, that's just, the, that's just the one. That's just the anti-aging piece right. of the beauty industry. Think right. of, think of who profits when, um, you know, natural transitions are, are medicalized, pathologized. Like you need to prevent these things. And I'm not a doctor. I am not saying they're not cases where you should have medical treatment or hormone, hormone replacement is a bad idea. But we are uh, conditioned to think, to blame every 
negative physical transition on age, even though a younger person might have that same thing. Someone might be born with that. The classic gag, I use it in my TED talk, but um, you know, I stopped blaming my sore knee on my age when I realized the other knee didn't hurt and it's just as old. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but they can, and maybe yeah. you need knee surgery and maybe you just need physical therapy and maybe you just need a vacation. But when we blame everything on age, then that in itself becomes a hugely profitable industry. Of course it does. All the supplements, um, you know, all the the stuff, this anti-aging, eternal life uh, crap. And, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's, you know, it does not work and there, and it's probably not good for you physically or, or psychologically. Certainly either really, it, no matter what they say, like turns out we age because everyone does because every day we age and that's just true. And there's the sense and there's that, power and beauty in it of too. Course. There certainly is. I turned 50 this year and, um, congratulations I feel good about it. Yeah. I feel good about it. <laughs> I'm smart. <laughs> I'm finally yeah. smart. So I finally know something, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, and, and fear, fear makes us stupid and fear divides us. And, you know, we, we, we know what, what, one thing we know more and more of modern medicine is that stress is bad for you. Right. No matter it, it, it causes inflammation, et cetera, et cetera, psychological problems and anxiety around getting wrinkles around your knee hurting around all the awful things that we just assume are going to happen, even though uh, most of them hundred percent will not, you know, the vast majority, um, that stress is bad for us. And there's, I mean, if, if I can, go go down one one rabbit hole on this because I want to be sure to mention it more and more fascinating research into the way attitudes towards aging affect our physical and cognitive function when we are terrified of oldness you know whatever it means to us and I'm not making fun of people that stress and fear makes us more vulnerable to exactly what we fear. And I'll just give one example. People with more positive, more realistic attitudes towards aging are less likely to get Alzheimer's, even if they have the gene that predisposes them to the disease. So if there's one reason to, to, to educate yourself, how about that? Seems like it's such, we've offered a, a variety of industries, the low hanging fruit of fear, as you mentioned, and shame. Um, somehow the two of them work together and it is, it, it can be baffling that the, these parts in us are so fragile around aging. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the capitalization on shame around getting older, which makes no sense. It makes no biological sense. And yet it's real. And we see it absolutely everywhere. Um, well, shame is never our friend, of course. It's never good for us. One really important thing to keep in mind, though, is that no, no prejudice is rational. Right. And ageism is actually a prejudice against our own future older selves. Talk about make no sense. Now, I want to be very clear that no prejudice makes sense. Right. It, it, because they're all based in stereotypes. And it's clearly irrational to think that every person who grew up in a place or has an accent like that or has a skin color like this is the same as everyone else. It's ne it's never rational. But you could make a case that ageism is particularly illogical. Excuse me, um, particularly illogical because it, it's a struggle in some basic sense between you and you, between this idea <laughs> me that your me. Mm -hmm. right me versus me that my future self, you know, um, is different from me that I'm not going to get old that I can put my hands over my ears and and slather myself with you know, potions and lotions and hope that it doesn't happen when, of course, unless you die, it's going to happen. 
But I think the basic point here is that no one makes money of satisfaction and shame and fear are profitable. And we also know from Instagram and social media, listen, I think there's lots of good things about social media, but one thing we do, especially on Instagram and on TikTok, and especially women, is compare ourselves to other women. And, you know, sometimes people say, do I have a mantra? I don't really, but my grandmother used to say, she didn't make it up, but she used to say, comparisons are odious. Any comparison between you and your sibling, between you and the kid next door, whether you can throw the ball, you know, better or less bad, whether they got an A and you got a C, it's just not good for us. And there's research now, as we know, from especially young, young women, you know, comparing themselves to other young women on Snapchat, putting on all these filters. And I will say, I think it's women are women's harshest critics. But when we think, oh, I need to look like that, and there, you know, and the that is this impossibly unattainable ideal or perhaps attainable for a short time through plastic surgery and extensive grooming and spending lots of money, um, you know, usually thin, usually white, usually blonde, you know, we know the drill or, you know, with like giant cheekbones and sucked in cheeks, et cetera, we set ourselves up to fail and we set ourselves up to be perennially, um, uh, shame is a bit strong, but, you know, certainly insecure and unhappy with the way we look. And I'm not the, I'll be the millionth person on your podcast to say that's not good for us. That's not good for us. I wonder if you could talk for a moment about some of the ways, because ageism is ubiquitous. I mean, it's, every, it's, it's really, and in, it's in every industry, it's in every narrative. Um, it's in representation and lack thereof. Um, we see it in entertainment. We see it in beauty. We see it in business. Um, it's a, it really is. It's in the air we breathe. And so can you talk for a few minutes about some of the ways, and of course this list is probably endless, but some of the ways ageism shows up that we might not even consider. Sometimes it's overt. Sometimes we can see an example of ageism and go, oh, come on guys. Like that's too much. Everybody calm down. But it's, it's in much smaller increments um, spread out much wider than that. So could you talk a little bit about ways that we experience ageism and maybe even perpetuate it? Well, knowingly or unknowingly. All, we all do. We are all ageist. I mean, I, you know, have lived and breathed this stuff for 15 years and I catch myself thinking ageist things all the time. Honestly, I'll see a young person, you know, fumble for something or forget something. I'm like, aha, young people forget things too. You know, <laughs> uh, that's not, that's not kind or friendly or helpful. Um, and it's an age-based assumption about, you know, we, we are being ageist anytime we make an assumption about a person or a group of people on the basis of how old we think they are. That's ageism. It can be a positive thing. Oh, they're old. They must know all about such and such or must be wise. Lots of older people are idiots, right? That's another ageist stereotype. <laughs> no one group of people is any one thing, like you exactly, said earlier. Exactly, exactly. Um, so all change begins in awareness. And this is true of any form of bias, you know, I think we're all also racist. If you're busy spending a lot of calories, and I do this sometimes going, oh, I'm not racist because look at this book about racism I just read or whatever. Get this thing I learned not to say. Still, we are bombarded with these ideas from the dominant culture since birth, and we all have them inside us. No judgment. We're human. We live in a society that's full of prejudice because groups are pitted against each other. That's the way our society works, unfortunately. And to some degree, that's the, you know, animals have to compete for resources. Um, so the very most important step to take is instead of looking for reasons that you're not ageist and being defensive, which is super, you know, uh, way more appealing than thinking about how you are, look for reasons 
in you know ways in which you are and if you find that you are well welcome to humanity because everyone is so don't beat yourself up pat yourself on the back for taking a deep breath and going hmm i need to think about this because ageism is sort of the last ism to the table if you will it is the least examined of all of them so these are new ideas to people which is one reason what you know i really enjoy what i do so um and a really good sort of litmus test is think about how you use the words old and young. I mean, have you ever said, I'm too old for that? Or I'm too young for that. I mean, in the classic one, you're you're probably still too young for this. But when that first AARP mailer hits your mailbox, sure. you know, oh, no, I'm, I'm like, that couldn't yeah, be me. Not me. I'm too young for that. I read sure. somewhere, probably apocryphally, that they send seven because they know it isn't till the seventh one that you open up. And they say like, ha ha, we finally opened this one. We got you. We got you. <laughs> but yeah. there is really, except in in childhood. There is no such thing as too young or too old. You might be too lazy. You might be too experienced. You might be too out of shape. You might be too short or too tall. But age is never the reason because there are other people your age who can do that thing, who want to do that thing. And there are other people your age who don't or can't or never did or whatever, right? It's never about age. So that is a really good starting place, you know, and then try use the reason, which is, you know, I, I'm too old for that. I'm too lazy or I did last week, you know, or I never did want to hang glide. So I'm not going to, you know, do it now. It's not because you're, you know, you're, you're older. It's because you're acrophobic or you'd rather go surfing or you'd rather watch TV and that's okay too. No wrong choices. Mm. Let's talk specifically about the beauty industry first. Um, so it's just where we see it show up so acutely. And and we're, we're confronted with it every day because we have eyes. So we can just simply do the scroll and see what there is. Yeah, well, um, and, and phones. 100%. But we, but we now, have it on course, the street. We have it on the street too, honestly. Have it on the street. Have it in our magazines. We have it in all of our advertising. Um, it, it, we, we can't, unless we go off the grid, we, the, we can't escape it. So it's hard to know. You know, a lot of ink is spilled on this, on the messages that women particularly, men get it too. So it's not as if they're free and men clear get here. it too. But they women do. Are but, women's harshest critics. That's right. And 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 I, I mean, I can certainly just look internally and say these are messages I started internalizing when I was in kindergarten. I mean, I it starts young. It starts very it starts young. So and young. We get the language early, and we get the images early, and it starts and so, so young. I just the I live in New York City where they're initiating. It's really cool a pilot program in in high schools to educate teenagers about ageism and one woman was it was a one young girl was it was a wall street journal article of all places and she said yeah i feel really old at 14 because her little sister and her little sister's friends are using social media apps that she doesn't know and i love that story it's not the beauty industry sorry a slight digression but it's like you, you think, you know whatever age you are that you're old and you've missed the thing well that's a that's a perennial aspect of culture and it shouldn't, it shouldn't intimidate us. It's just, you know, it, whatever field you're in, the, the, I mean, it's certainly ramped up by the invention of the internet, but nevertheless, every, every human has to consistently adapt to these changes. It's not a function of how old you are. It's so insidious though. And as much as I hear this conversation in, in good news being elevated right now, of course, we're, we're certainly aware that we are being handed a bill of goods. You know, that is something we've at least acknowledged. We know is true. You we think can... everyone is? Well, maybe I should say in my world, at least this conversation is slightly more centered than it once was, which was sort of an invisible discussion that we were just supposed to bend ourselves around to absorb. At least now, women 
seem to be onto it. My, I've got the body acceptance movement had a big, I think this all goes together probably. And this next generation, I, I've got a bunch of young kids. I have five kids and they're like 18 to 25. And so they're, I notice my girls in the young adult world are, they're approaching media literacy differently than we ever did. Of course we didn't, these apples and oranges a little bit. We don't have the same world as they have, but um, they are at least in my observation, a little bit less susceptible to it all. They're a little bit more willing to call bullshit on the whole kit and caboodle, which is encouraging. But here's my question to you. Here we are at, at whatever level of awareness we are. Let's just say maybe it's a little bit more than it used to, but what do, what are we supposed to do? How do we begin to even remotely turn the tide? Um, not just internally on how we respond to all this messaging, but externally where there's such a negative attitude about aging. There's such a callous cruelty around we, the way people talk. Break that up yep. into two yep, questions let's break it up. because they you know, the, 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 how do we break it up in the world is a huge yeah. multifaceted Let's start internally. answer in itself. Um, so I just want to say like the overarching point is there is no right way to do this. There is no one way to do this. The world is full of voices telling people, women in particular, what we should do, what we shouldn't put on our faces, what we should, what we should look like. And I don't want to be one of those voices because aging is complicated and it's unique to each of us. So we each need to do what we do in our own way and in our own time. I, you know, celebrities um, get so much flack about, you know, Madonna being sort of the, the above, you know, overarching icon. And I've, I got to say, you know, I don't love what she looks like now, but Madonna has spoken out about ageism since she was 25. Her age is always foregrounded and she has done a double taboo. She has maintained this amazing body and she has done so as an overtly sexual woman. So I say, Madonna, thank you for having the courage to be who you are unapologetically in the world. And I think it's really, really important if we can, it's so hard, but for women to work harder on suspending judgment of other women and of ourselves to try and look more generously at each other and ourselves. Because if we look, and this is a very narrow metric, I don't mean to say you have to be a rock star and have sex with handsome people in order to like, See, that's not, that is a goal for some people, but for the sake of argument, if you think like being romantically sexually active is a goal, look at who is, it's not the thinnest, it's not the whitest, right? It's not the prettiest. It's not the youngest. It is the people, the women in general who know that their lovers are lucky, right? Confidence is the ultimate aphrodisiac. It is really hard to look. I mean, I'm 71. I look 71. I got wrinkles. You know, I don't, there are mornings when I look in the mirror and I go, God, what happened? Not proud of that, but you know, I'm only human. But if I can, <clears throat> you know, beat back the next thing, which says, oh my God, I look horrible, you know, who, whatever, and say, you, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to make it about me, but, but to understand that I am an interesting sexual being who is fun to be with. And I can carry that out in the world. You know, that is, I mean, we all know, I know you've, I know you've gone to an event wearing your baggiest sweatpants with dirty hair, but something about you feels good that day. And you get attention because you feel good about yourself that day. And we've all been dressed to the nines but felt insecure, or unhappy about something. And that translates to, so it truly is not about whether you are styled by someone, whether you have learned how to do whatever it's called to your face, where it's a completely different shape. I know I do know the word contouring, but you know, <laughs> it is how you feel about 
yourself. And it is the work of a lifetime, you know, to beat this back. Um, but I will say another thing. So, so that's my answer. Um, I would also urge people to try and do this in the company of women of all ages. I think it's too few of us have significantly older and younger friends. And I don't mean to make it just about women, but, um, you know, if, if more younger women or friends with older women, they would see how coming into our own is a source of enormous power and satisfaction. And if more of us were friends with younger women, we would be, you know, we wouldn't have this envy. We can be, we all know that, that older women can be unkind. It works both ways. Um, you know, you can, can not want to hang out with younger people because it makes you know, makes us look old or whatever, so to speak. And nothing can make you look old, of course. Um, and we are reminded of how hard it is to be young. Yeah, uh, you are so right. Right. And so that opens up a little space for empathy and compassion. That is so true. So I really, really urge women to, um, you know, to try and to find find a mixed yeah. age group. Uh, you know, uh, you know, think of yeah. something you'd like to do, find a mix, have a, have a reading group, have a whatever group, you know, but make sure reach across age. It's so true. Uh, my little group of best friends right here in Austin, there's four of us and we have a 20 year span. Nice. Um, All right. Go so for 40. I, you're right. You're I so right. You. We do because grab, we, think, we grab on we either end. Age, oh, that young person won't want to be with me because won't want, you know, won't, or we won't have anything in common. Well, it's true. You might have different cultural references, but you might not, right? You might all love Taylor Swift. You might all love reggae. You might all love cha-cha, you know, whatever. You don't know till you talk to that person and, and class and geography and education and all sorts of whether you're athletic or not, all those things play a much bigger part. Politics, right. I hate to say it, you know, sure. no, it does. whether or not you're going to have something to say to that yes. person, then how old they happen to be. You're hundred percent right. Because we live in such an age segregated society, we think that mm. age is what makes people uh, brings people together, mm. but that's, that's not actually an affinity thing. That's mm -hmm. a structural thing. Does that make sense? You're exactly right. Oh, yeah. you're so right. And you, I like, <laughs> I like how you remind us that, um, having friends across age gaps, um, take some of the romance out of whatever we're applying to a younger version of ourselves. My girlfriend, who's got a first grader and a preschooler, my baby is about to graduate from high school. So that's in my rearview mirror. And, you know, when she's like, oh, I can't, I need to go home. I've got to get the kids to bed. We've got to do bath time. I'm like, oh God, no, my God, that's no. Done. Oh my God. I'm so happy. I don't have to do that anymore. And let me also say, I think it's also true in romantic relationships. Mm. You know, I, I do. I think mm. we think, you know, if you want to start a family, you're right. Age is yeah. a real, um, sure. you know, a boundary. If you're in fertility space if, or whatever. If you're yeah. In a, in a, in a family space. And also I would say, in a, if you want to do extreme sports because, you know, our, our bodies become less suited in general. Although look at all the 80 year olds running marathoners, mar marathons, even that, I can't really say that, but, um, you know, sexually older women and younger men are a perfect, you know, are, are a match, but I'm sure it can work in every direction. And I don't mean to make it all heteronormative here, but we assume that a younger person wouldn't be of interest. Why do we assume that? I don't young know why, way, you know? Yeah, you're right. And women are coming into their sexual confidence, the older they get. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, we do think, you know, your body doesn't look the way it used to. We're conditioned to think the way it, that the way it looked was better. And, you know, I didn't like standing in front of a mirror when I was 15. I, you know, I, I can't say it's my favorite thing now, but that's generally, we are so much our own harshest critics. And if you can come in and say, you know, anyone's lucky, you know, someone is lucky to be with me with my clothes on or my clothes off and you can carry that into the space, you will be rewarded. It's not easy and it's not for everybody. And I don't want anyone listening to this to say, 
you know, that I said you should do A, B, C. But, but try to open your mind to perhaps a broader range of possibilities. I love this. It goes back to that idea of confidence, which is incredibly empowering. It really can rewire our brains and our thoughts and the way we perceive ourselves and even see ourselves. And, and when it's, you a, it's are, powerful. It is powerful. It's really hard to get there, but a tool that helps me because I'm, you know, sort of nerdy and thinky is like when I, it's something about me, when I don't like it, or I feel insecure, or I'm looking at an advertisement that's, that's, you know, preaching to that, look at where those messages come from. Look, literally look at their source and think who benefits, think who profits. Same with body acceptance, you know, think, think who, who is making money off your fears. And as an activist in the larger sense, you know, all prejudice operates to pit people against each other. And if we're squabbling, we're not going to challenge these larger forces. Classic example, it's women arguing about who's a better mother. If you, are you a better mom, if you're working or if you stay at home, how about we not fight about that and join forces to close the gender wage gap, which is still there. It's barely budged in 30 years so that women can make enough money to choose whether or not to stay home. I'd love to hear you talk more at the top of the show. You mentioned your foray into research and you started um, examining people who were older than you, uh, they were eighties plus, And that you said virtually everything I thought wasn't right. Um, I had these ideas which did not flesh out, um, as a, I'd like to hear you talk more about that. What were some of the, the preconceived ideas you brought into those interviews and into that research and what did you discover instead? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one was that I, I had this sort of, I thought, well, it's all going to, obviously it's all going to suck. It's just going to get worse. Um, and just in a fact, downward trajectory, downward trajectory, uh -huh. if you're having a hard time now, it's just going to get harder. And in fact, if you, uh, Google, um, U curve of happiness and my mother and I used to say, I don't believe it. And I'd say, well, thank you for quabbling with one of the best substantiated facts out there study after study around the world it's you don't have to be rich you don't have to be married you don't have to be healthy shows that life satisfaction you hit this midlife trough when life is really complicated you have a ton of responsibilities uh you you are realizing you're probably not going to be an astronaut or a ballerina and you think it's all gonna suck okay that's one another reason. And that happiness increases in later life. Could have knocked me over with a feather. I also assumed that um uh you know that 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 death get is getting closer and that fear that fear must be. I imagine this like shadow of the grim reaper leaning across my, you know, sad little iron bedstead as I curled up like a leaf. And um you do. You know, your, your time gets shorter and you do become aware of that. But it turns out that the longer people live, the less they fear dying. They don't want to die. They especially don't want to die in pain. The fear diminishes because we get better. And this is part of the psychological underpinnings of that U-curve. We get better at not sweating the small stuff. And we get better, the knowledge that awareness that time is short makes us better at accepting, at living in the moment. You know, think about it. And we know, and I'm no like Buddhist sage here. I can't say that I don't worry about dying ever, but I take comfort in knowing that I'm likely to fit into the much bigger part of the pizza where it ceases to, you know, preoccupy me. Another one, I thought that the odds of ending up in some grim institution were pretty good. When I started this research, which was um, so almost 20 years ago, do you wanna take a guess at the percentage 
percentage of people, Americans over 65 in nursing homes. Now, nursing homes, mind you, not okay. all senior, you know, like hussies. assisted living, we're pulling yeah. that out. Okay. But, right. But I, many I, assisted livings have a nursing home component. Is it? Is it 10%? I would have guessed, I would have guessed 20 or 30 back then. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was 4%. It's oh. now two and a half. Is that right? Wow. Right. I've never that. heard that. No, I know. Never That's heard that stuff. Sometimes I say I'm in the both sides of the story business. We need rate uh, dementia. Worried about getting dementia. Did you know that dementia rates are falling? Yes. Go search it. You know, like enter it. Don't, I mean, it's there. Alzheimer's is a terrible disease. There are more cases of it because there are more older people as a percentage of the population. And age is the biggest risk factor. I'm not going to like, you know, gloss over any of these things, but the odds of you or I being diagnosed with Alzheimer's have gotten lower and lower and people are being diagnosed at later ages. And to return to the fact that I just put out earlier, if you, when you can't find your glasses and you think, oh my God, I'm getting Alzheimer's, that anxiety, because it's stress, makes you more vulnerable to getting Alzheimer's. Let's talk about your book. Um, your book is called <laughs> This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism. Um, and I, I just, I'm so delighted to have this conversation in the zeitgeist. It's, it's really actually encouraging. And I wonder if it's you can really talk happening. for a moment. You know, it's, it's, it's gaining all kinds of momentum. It should, it should, as our population has grown more and more and more of us are going to age. And it's just that, that, that bell curve is going to be larger. And so the, we, we can't come into this stage of life, anxious and stressed and misinformed. Um, this is the time to learn and right size the information. Um, can you talk for a little bit before I have to let you go about your book? And um, this is essentially a compilation of a ton of your work. And what what are you hoping when you put this in people's hands that they walk away with? And who should read it? Oh, uh, uh, well, I would like, I would say first to say for. First of all, it is fun to read. It is really a good read. Um, there's a lot of fiber in there. I think when people hear manifesto, they think they're going to be screamed at. And I promise you won't be screamed at. Um, but I think, I mean, of course, every writer thinks everyone should read their book. I had trouble selling it because publishers, uh, it's age cooties. You know, they think anything to do with aging is going to be sad and icky. And then they said, well, where, where in the bookstore do we put it? And what I really wanted to say was, that's your damn job. I'm a writer, you're a publisher, figure it out. But they had a point in that anyone should read this book who wants to have a more accurate and therefore more positive understanding of the years ahead, right? and an understanding of, of the forces that frame it as decline. Like, what are we all up against? And I mean, I hope get a little riled up like I did. Like, wait, why am I being sold this bill of goods that is so bad for me personally, psychologically, harmful for me physically, and so destructive socially because it divides us. Right, all this crap, this generational labels about how Generation X hates the boomers and the boomers don't care about young people. That's totally false. I won't go off. You can hear from my voice that whole discussion makes me very angry because it's 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 really malicious and harmful. But anyway, so anyone who wants to age better feel better about the years ahead. There is a, a very widespread presumption that it's just a book for old people. Aging is not something sad that old people do. Aging is something we embark on the day we are born. And the earlier in life you get this memo, if you can avoid stepping on this hamster wheel of fear and denial, I mean, what you see now on, you know, uh, on, on Instagram, you know, 14 year olds are starting their anti wrink, their wrinkle prevention program. Well, you want to not wrinkle, stay inside and never smile. 
you know, that's a, that's a crap idea. So, <laughs> you know, so, so I wish 14 year olds would get, I mean, I think you maybe have to be a little bit older because you have to see your trajectory through life, which is hard to do as a teenager, no diss to teenagers, you know, any, any negative statement about teenagers is ageist too. It is any judgment on the basis of age, including you're too young. When younger people have trouble getting established in the job market, for example, that's ageism. We should each be judged on the basis of what we are capable of and interested in, right? So, um, but back to the bookstore, God forbid I should de defend, defend the bookstores, uh, the booksellers, I mean, but, you know, it could be, not only could it be in the self-help section or the publicity section or the women's studies section or the sociology section, you could be the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. It doesn't matter what gender you are or what you do. You have to be someone who is curious about this and is interested in thinking differently. Because there is a lot we cannot control, no matter how rich and white and privileged and educated you might happen to be. And the classic example are these, they are rich white men in Silicon Valley that are throwing millions at stopping aging, you know, leaving aside why that's philosophically a problematic idea. Guess what? They're still waking up a day older, right? There are all sorts of aspects of aging we cannot control, like good old luck above all. But one thing we can control is our attitudes. And if you learn about aging, you will be less afraid. And that, and that knowledge, that information is going to confer all kinds of protection and information about um, aging as well as you possibly can. Hmm. I like this. Let's, let's land, let's land it here. Maybe, I don't know, three or four brass tacks, actual practical shifts or changes, uh, consumer habits pick that we can adopt to, to slowly push back against the narrative. Because even as you say, ages and pits generations against each other, I mean, there is so much being said about how we are supposed to think and talk about millennials and now how we're supposed to talk about Gen Z and how we are supposed to disparage them and them us and the whole boomer thing. Like, that's a whole deal. Like, that is it's a business. whole deal, which is not true for me. I, I, I have yeah. beloved, wonderful people in every single generation. So I don't get it. I'm like, wait, Let that's not how I experience you. them. Who benefits? Who's profiting yeah. from generational labels? Right. Who? The, 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 the beauty industry, for sure. But beauty is marketers. Um, it works. It sells. And, and also, to some degree, I mean, demographers are not like running to the bank, but, you know, they're people who study population changes and journalists. They love label. If it's if you can say, you know, everyone in generation, you know, fill in the blank, wants everyone in generation fill in the blank to drop dead, billion people are going to read that story. But, you know, the, the actual story, like most of us muddling along just fine, does not get clicks. But there is, in the workplace in particular, there is this lucrative industry of so-called, it's not so-called, generational consulting. And the research actually shows that, wait for it, most employees want the same thing. They want to be treated respectfully. They want flex time. They want health care. You know, they, they want, you know, I mean, there, there are, there are small differences, but they have more to do. You might need more, um, want to work fewer hours, but you're going to want to work fewer hours in midlife if you have um, responsibilities or, or if you need to work six jobs, you know, whatever it is, it depends on our social situation, on our family situation, on our economic situation, way more than it does on how old we are. No generational stereotype is true. So one piece of advice I would say is just block the generational labels and I'll make an even bigger ask. Try not to even use the word generation. It has no scientific basis except 
in the sense that your daughter is a different generation from you and her son is a different gen in a narrow mm. genealogical sense. In the sense. family dynamic, right. yeah. A generation is real. No scientist, social scientist has ever agreed on any other definition, which you see if you start to look like, oh, Jen, whatever it is begins here, but wait, that's only 10 years and this is 14 years. So use age group. Instead of saying boomers, millennials, just say older people or younger people because it doesn't dump us in buckets. It does, it's always accurate. And then because back, back to us all being ageist, the minute we have a number, the minute we have an age, the minute we have a label, all sorts of preconceived ideas click into place. That's what our brains evolved to do, right? So try and break that habit. That's great. This is great. And we've barely started. I mean, there's nope. a million layers under this. Always. And so people can learn from you. They can learn from your book. They can learn from your blog. They can learn from your website. So um, will you just I'm say on, one I'm more on time? Social media. I haven't weaned myself off Twitter X yet. I keep feeling I should, but yeah, um, I'm, so. I, I, I had to walk away, but I'm elsewhere. But will you just remind my listening community where to find you? Because yeah. there's your endless source of resources here. <laughs> Well, thank you for mentioning exactly that. Um, I started with two colleagues um, in 2018, a site called Old School, because we thought this movement is new. Wouldn't it be cool if all the really good vetted resources about age ageism, what it is, how it works, what you can do about it, were in one place. So it's the Old School Anti-Ageism Clearinghouse, oldschool.info searchable by topic. It has infographics. It has language guides. It has videos. It has all podcast, whatever your learning style is. And it's searchable by topic. So you can go in and there's a, like where to get started. So everything you ever wanted to know up to date about ageism is in old school, old school .info. My website is this chairrocks.com. You, my blog is there. Um, I'm also at this chair rocks on Twitter and Instagram. I, I'm easy to find. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm the only person. I, th I think there's now a young kid somewhere named Ashton Applewhite, but oh, I'm yeah. not him. Yeah. Um, so otherwise, I'm really uh -huh. easy to find. If you can't Your find me. Your name has made a resurgence not trying. Kind of in the, like, the, young, the young generation. There's a bunch of Ashton. I doubt that. I think uh -huh. Ashton Hutcher probably has a bit yeah. more with the popularity of Ashton <laughs> than I do, but I got there first. Um, you did. And uh, so, and also I have a blog called Yo, Is This Ageist? All of these, you can get to all of these things through my main blog, which is thischairrocks.com and, and the book and all the rest. And if you have the time, everything is free on old school, except books, you know, they cost money. Um, but if you have the time to read my book, I promise you will find it entertaining and I promise it will make you feel better about the years ahead and hopefully... Um, energized to um, join the movement in whatever way, at whatever scale you feel like it. I do have a mailing list. I will never give your email away and I will only get it together to write you a few times a year. So there's that. Perfect. Um, so everybody listening, we'll round all those up into one spot for you. So you can have a one click um, portal into all things Ashton. Thank you for coming on the show today. I, this was such an encouraging conversation. I wasn't sure where this conversation was going and I, I loved so many things you had to say, and I, I felt my shoulders relax a little bit today. See, you feel so, better. Thank yeah. you. And not because yeah. I'm such a genius, but because we are brainwashed to be afraid and apprehensive. And again, there are real reasons to be afraid and to be apprehensive, apprehensive but a lot of them have to do with society wants us to feel that way. And once we see those forces at work, that is liberating and really a source of power and strength. Outstanding. I'm delighted to have met you. Thank you, you so much for your time and your energy. Thanks for bringing this conversation to bear in my community. Um, every, the, I, I'm my own median age. We're all about, we're turning 50 <laughs> more or less right now. And so this is a conversation we're having and yeah. And this is the way I want to have it. So Fantastic. thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for being here. Me. Bye. All right, you guys. Maybe there's not so much to fear after all, right? I loved that conversation. 
I really did. I love that. That that did something. I, I really responded um, to all of that information. And um, I'm grateful for that and feeling more hopeful, not less than before we started this particular episode. I, again, there's so much here. So I'm going to, if you go to jinhatmaker.com and under the podcast tab, I'll have this episode, I'll have the show notes and then everything Ashton related, all, both of her sites, her blogs, her subscriber list, all the things that she mentioned, her socials. Um, this is the kind of social media diet that we want to increase, right? Like it is possible to use social media for our good and not our harm. And this is one of the ways how is that we really begin curating our feed toward healthy, encouraging, true spaces, not ones that are constantly making us feel less than um, bad or scared. So anyhow, appreciate so much Ashton being on the show today. And I just love this whole series. We are we are trying to tackle these ideas and to bring these fears down to the ground, really examine them and decide what can we let go of here. And so there's more to come. If you haven't already subscribed to the show, please do so. Just wherever you get your podcast, just hit sub subscribe and you'll never miss an episode. Just show it for you week after week. Um, because on behalf of Laura and her team over at Four Eyes Media and Amanda and I, we sure love creating the show for you and it's our honor to do so. All right, you guys see you next week.